Thank you very much. Can you can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, and of course, it's, it's wonderful to have this uh, meeting in this time of confinement. So I'm very grateful to, to you guys. So uh, I'm going to talk about the derivation of the, of the kinetic wave equation. Um, so I will first uh, present the, the problem uh, and then try to uh, sketch the, the elements of proof that we have. Uh, most of what I will present is joint work with uh, Charles Collot, uh, who, who, who was a postdoc at Courant and who went back to the CNRS. Uh, so the outline will be first, I will uh, introduce, say, the idea, the concept of weak turbulence, which is very closely related to the kinetic wave equation. Uh, then I will show you how this equation can be uh, derived heuristically. And then I will give ideas that, that uh, lead to a partial rigorous proof of this derivation. Uh, so let's start with weak turbulence and I'm going to try and explain how it relates to the, the kinetic wave equation. Uh, so weak turbulence is uh, the word used by physicists to describe a chaotic regime which emerges in weakly nonlinear uh, dispersive equations. So that's, a, you know, very broad class of systems with countless physical applications. As far as I'm concerned, the simplest instance is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation set on the torus. Uh, so you, you might choose your favorite nonlinear dispersive equation, but it's already very difficult for this uh, sort of model problem in a way. Uh, so we're going to stick to to this one today. So uh, nonlinear Schrodinger, I hardly need to present it. Uh, the unknown u is uh, complex valued. And the domain we consider is the, the torus, so rd mod zd, uh, which, uh, so sorry, t is of course real valued and x is in rd mod zd, uh, which helps because uh, we have a very nice, uh, Fourier transform on the torus, and it's going to be very useful. Uh, what's known about this equation? Uh, so, Bourguin made uh, very deep contributions to the, the theory of its local and global well posedness. Uh, as far as local well posedness, uh, it holds if you're slightly above the scaling. So in HS with S bigger than D over two minus one. Uh, so this was a paper of Bourguin in the nineties. Uh, and this system, which is Hamiltonian has two conserved quantities, the mass, which is just the L2 norm and the energy, which is the H1 norm plus the L4 norm. Uh, there is a typo, it's U to the four, not gradient to the four, of course. So as usual, if you combine local well posedness below, uh, sorry, yeah, local well posedness at the regularity, which is less than the conserved quantities, uh, you obtain global well posedness. And indeed, uh, this is what happens for NLS. You do get global well posedness in H1 in the so-called defocusing case and in dimensions two and three. Uh, so this could sound like this is the end of the story. We have a global solution. It conserves the mass and the energy. What more could we ask for? Well, what we would like to know is, is how this solution behaves. What does it look like if I wait for a very long time? Uh, what can I say about the solution? Uh, so that's the question of large time behavior. The big question uh, about which almost nothing is known, is what is the qualitative behavior of, of the solution as t gets very large. 
And the expectation uh, from physicists as well as mathematicians is that uh, energy should be transferred to high frequencies uh, or small length scales. Of course, as much as allowed by the conserved quantities of the problem, but, but the expectation is that uh, as much as allowed by these conserved quantities, the system is trying to push energy towards uh, high frequencies. Uh, now, this is an expectation and it's very little is known rigorously about this question. Uh, in particular, this cannot be always true. It has to be generically true because we know of counterexamples. And if this happens, this is probably linked to some sort of chaotic behavior to which I will come back. So the picture uh, that you see with waves is an attempt to uh, you know, ex uh, explain visually what we're looking at. It's waves which are confined, like we all are, and which keep on bumping into, into each other. And these nonlinear interactions drive the solution towards high frequencies. At least that's, that's the expectation. Um, so one way of capturing this effect that uh, solutions uh, are driven towards high frequencies is to monitor sub OLF norms. Uh, if indeed uh, the solutions are, are uh, pushing energy to high frequencies, then if I look at F in H100, its norm should get very big. Uh, so, in particular, uh, Bourguin asked whether there exists a solution whose H100, say, norm goes to infinity as T goes to infinity. Uh, but I think to this day, this question is unanswered. Uh, there are upper bounds, uh, which say that the sub OLF norm can grow at most polynomially. And there are lower bounds. So this is Bourguin and Staffilani. And there are lower bounds, which say that if you give me lambda small and m large, then I can find a solution which goes from very small to very large in HS in finite time. So that's sort of the, the, best, the best result so far which is due to the I-team, Coliander, Kiel, Stefilani, Takao, Katao. And so best result in terms of proving that sub OLF norm growth does happen. Uh, there was earlier work of Cooksin, uh, Guardian, Kaloshin, and Hani Posader, Tsvetkov, Michilia also have important results in this direction. Uh, now, how is this connected to weak turbulence? Uh, so that's where uh, physics, if you want, enters the picture. Uh, physicists believe that um, this, this norm growth, this tendency to go to high frequencies, uh, actually happens in a regime which is turbulent. Uh, so, of course, turbulent is a bit of a vague word, uh, but it, it means something like uh, there is some chaotic uh, interactions going on. More precisely, if we look at NLS, uh, so we look at NLS and I added two parameters. Uh, there is lambda squared in front of the nonlinearity, and the torus now has size capital L. So there are these two parameters. Uh, one we're going to think of as being small, lambda, and one we're going to think of as being big, capital L. And as for the data, we think of it as being fixed. Uh, so, of course, up to rescaling, we could uh, look at the standard unit torus and have a solution which is very high frequency. So that's the uh, analogy, the uh, counterpart, if you want. The scaling equivalent is to, is to look at a solution which lives at frequency one and is, is, is set on a very big, very big torus. So the regime in which weak turbulence uh, should emerge, or at least in which it 
it could be described by, uh, by an equation, is the one where lambda goes to zero, which amounts to weak nonlinearity. L goes to infinity, which you can view as infinite volume or high frequency, depending on your taste. And finally, that's the most delicate assumption, the Fourier coefficients, UK hat, um, if you write their polar decomposition, the angle that comes out, theta k, is random and uh, two angles corresponding to two Fourier modes are independent. Uh, this, it's easy to see that this cannot be true literally. There has to be some correlation. Uh, but physicists you usually call this the random phase approximation. And, and it, it, it amounts to asking all the angles of the Fourier modes to be uh, uh, decorrelated. So, and, and this is an idealization, right? It cannot be exactly true. So if you have these three assumptions, uh, there is a conjecture that uh, if you take the expectation of the square of the modulus of the k Fourier mode, you call this rho k. So rho k is the expectation of the modulus squared of the k Fourier mode. The expectation with respect to what? That's part of the question, but essentially with respect to these random angles. So you have an ensemble of solution, uh, which has this uh, random phase approximation, and you take an expectation with respect to this uh, ensemble. Then the conjecture is that uh, if you properly rescale time, uh, this quantity rho k will solve a kinetic equation. Uh, so the, the kinetic equation is dt rho k equals uh, c of rho of k, where c is the collision operator, uh, which I wrote uh, below. Uh, so it's an integral over frequencies, and there are two delta functions. Uh, the first one is requiring that frequencies add up to zero, which makes sense. And the second one should be thought of as a resonance condition, resonance in the sense of Hamiltonian systems. Uh, so the formula might look a little bit scary, I, uh, I admit. Uh, but it's actually, if you know, for instance, the Boltzmann equation, uh, this kinetic wave equation is a close relative of the Boltzmann equation. Uh, the main difference is that the Boltzmann equation is quadratic, while this kinetic wave equation is cubic. Uh, but the deltas appear uh, exactly the same for the Boltzmann kernel if you write it this way. Usually it's written with another um, parametrization. So that's the kinetic wave equation. And so the conjecture is that it derives from the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in the proper limit. And the next conjecture is that this equation actually describes this, this drive towards high frequencies uh, that, that we say was conjectural. So, so if you want this kinetic wave equation, it's, a, it's an intermediary step between NLS and uh, understanding what generic solutions do. Uh, so I should say this equation was first written by Piles. Uh, so it was in the early days of quantum mechanics. And you can also derive this uh, equation in the context of the uh, n-body problem for uh, quantum particles. Then it was revived in the 60s by Hasselman, who was working on uh, gravity water waves, and uh, more recently, Zaharoff and his school, who had a very deep impact on, this, on these questions. So there are no 
rigorous derivation of this kinetic wave equation. Uh, but there is a very nice result by Lukanian and Spohn, uh, which, which is related to, to that. Let me not enter the, the question. Uh, there is a result by Escobedo and Velasquez, which describes the dynamics of this kinetic wave equation, and it has very interesting uh, dynamical properties. And there is results by Erdos and Yao and others, but I'm just citing Erdos and Yao, uh, who, who worked on uh, the linear Schrodinger equation with a random potential for which you can derive a, a kinetic equation and, and it shares many similarities with what I'm discussing today, except that it's linear. So some things are, are simpler. Okay, um, so after uh, explaining how, how this uh, kinetic wave equation comes up, uh, I'm gonna tell you how it can be derived uh, heuristically. So maybe this will be a bit technical. Uh, it will get uh, less technical again afterwards, uh, but I, I, I hope I, I think it's helpful to, to get an idea for how the derivation should work and what are the steps that are, that are missing. Uh, right, so let's go back to our equation. So it's NLS, except we added a small parameter uh, in front of the nonlinearity, lambda, and we have a big parameter, capital L, which gives the size of the torus. Now, it's very natural to expand U in Fourier series. Uh, the AK of T are the Fourier coefficients. And it's also very natural to filter by the linear group. Uh, this is this TK squared in the exponent. Uh, why is it natural to filter by the linear group? Well, because the equation is weakly nonlinear. So the sort of leading order term in, in a sense is, is the linear dynamics. So we, we might as well uh, filter by it. Okay. And then what you do is you, you write the equation satisfied by these Fourier coefficients. So it's a small computation and, and this is what you get. Uh, so it's the uh, equation with the braces. Uh, so what do you observe? Well, frequencies k, l, m, n have to add up to zero. That's of course classical. And what's important is that uh, there is this term e to the two pi i t omega, where omega is minus k squared plus l squared minus m squared plus n squared. So it's the resonance modulus. And you see that it makes a big difference whether omega is zero, in which case there is no oscillations, or whether omega is not zero, in which case there is some averaging going on, which will uh, dampen the interaction. And you remember in the kinetic wave equation, we have this delta of omega effectively. So only resonant interactions will survive in the limit. This is a classical idea in Hamiltonian dynamics. Uh, okay, so the first step is to expand the solution in A0. So A0 is the initial data. Uh, so it's a small computation. Uh, and you see it gets ugly pretty fast. So I, I only wrote the first terms in the expansion. Um, so you see you have a, a term which is linear in A0, then a term which is cubic in A0, quintic, and you could go on, but actually you cannot really go on because it's, it's just becoming crazy very soon. So I, j I only wrote the, the the terms that we will need in the following. So it's, you know, makes a lot of sense to just expand in the, in the data. 
and this is what you get. Uh, I should say there are two ideas. One idea is that uh, expanding in the data amounts to expanding in lambda, which is the small parameter. So that's good. And also expanding in the data, uh, we will assume that the data have random phases, so decorrelated phases. And if you write this explicit uh, expansion, it's very easy to track these decorrelated uh, phases. Okay. Uh, the next thing is to use, uh, you know, essentially the weak formula, uh, which I call parity pairing. So you choose the data to be something deterministic. So AK naught is square root of RK times IID complex Gaussians. So that if you take the expectation of a product of this A naught KI, uh, well, you have a weak formula. And so in order for this expectation of the product to be non-zero, uh, you should be able to pair each KI with an LI. If you cannot do that, uh, then the expectation is zero. And uh, of course, there are more complicated cases when KI is repeated, but let's not enter into that. So, so now you have this formula for the expectation of the product of the AKI. And remember, we expanded AK in this A in, as, as a multilinear series in this A not KI. So if you compute the expectation of modulus of AK squared, using uh, the using the formula that we had um, what what uh, comes out is uh, what i wrote in the second half of the slide uh, so this follows from a simple application of the weak formula and you see it starts looking like the kinetic wave equation, uh, but we have essentially two things to do. One is take the sum and turn it into an integral. So this is a discrete to continuous limit, uh, sort of Riemann sum type limit. So this is classical and we know how to do that. And the other thing is we'd like to turn the, the term e to the 2 pi i t omega minus 1 over 2 pi omega. We'd like to turn this term into delta of omega. Uh, but but it's, it's, it's not going to be too hard either. So let me, let me show you how this works. Oops. Uh, so the first thing is to take the limit L to infinity. And this has the effect of turning the sum into an integral. Uh, so it's your know, classical idea, Riemann sum. Uh, so maybe I'm not going to dwell too much on that. Uh, what you need to do is to use some, some uh, number theory to control uh, how the, the points at which you sample are, are distributed uh, with respect to, to the manifold where omega is zero, which is uh, around which there is a singularity. But so let me not uh, talk too much about that. Uh, the fourth step is to take the large time limit, t to infinity. And then you see that the, the, the term e to the i t omega minus one over omega squared, this term turns into a delta function. So it's a simple exercise in distribution theory, if you want. And what comes out is the uh, collision kernel C that, that you saw earlier. Uh, except earlier, I wrote it as a, as a sum of cubic terms. And here, 
but it's equivalent, of course, if you if you expand the product, uh, it, 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 it's going to look like a sum of cubic terms. So that's for the heuristic derivation. What are we missing to, to make it rigorous? Uh, so there is one element which is, you know, this Riemann sum type story. Uh, so it, it takes a bit of, of, of thinking, but it's not the main uh, hindrance. The main hindrance is that in, in this story that I told you, I only considered the first terms in the expansion. And of course, uh, there are many others that come after and you need to, you need to control them. And so that's, that's, what, that's where the, the problem lies. Okay, uh, yeah, so to summarize, that's the conclusion, what we found heuristically. Uh, if you take the expectation of the kth Fourier mode and you subtract the data phi of k, then what you find is C naught T over T kin times this collision uh, operator. So uh, T kin is the time over which kinetic effects are, are felt. And uh, what's, what this term is, C naught T over T kin times the collision term, is of course the, the derivative, if you want, at time zero, of the evolution given by the kinetic wave equation. So initially, it evolves like uh, the collision term. Uh, and of course, if you wait longer, you're not gonna see just the linear, tar the linear piece, but you're gonna see the, the other terms of the, of the expansion. Okay, so that's for the heuristic part. Uh, now, let me tell you, uh, what, what we proved and, and how we proved uh, something rigorous. So that's a uh, theorem in collaboration with Charles Collot. So once again, uh, you look at U solving the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, small parameter lambda, large parameter L, and you take a data which has this Fourier expansion with complex Gaussians, which make up for uh, random phases. Then the, the equivalent formula that was found uh, two slides ago holds true, uh, namely the expectation of AK squared minus the data is equivalent to uh, what the kinetic wave equation predicts. However, this is only if uh, capital L equals lambda squared. So there is a specific scaling here. Uh, and there is also the condition that T should be much less than T kin. Um, by which I mean t should be less than t kin to the one minus epsilon for some small epsilon. Uh, now you're gonna tell me L equals lambda squared does not seem to be consistent with L being very big and lambda being very small. I agree with that. Uh, and actually, I, I, I oversimplified a bit. It's not lambda that has to be very small. Uh, it's the size of u which is uh, related to lambda. But so okay, let me not get into that. Uh, okay, so what's very nice is that we get very close to the kinetic time scale, uh, but we don't we don't reach it. And it's it's the first result of this kind. Uh, I, I should mention an earlier result that I obtained in collaboration with uh, Tristan Buckmaster, uh, Zahar Hani, and Jalil Shatta, uh, where we obtained a time scale which is, which is less good than the one here, but it was really the first result uh, that, that was uh, you know, proving, uh, giving a, a statement 
about the validity of the kinetic wave equation. So that was this first result with uh, Buckmaster Hanishata. And also, uh, uh, there was an independent result that appeared at the same time as ours uh, by uh, Yu Deng and Zara Hani. Uh, there are differences, but mostly they reach the same conclusion as we do. Uh, mainly, there are differences in the way in which they uh, control nonlinear interactions through uh, diagrams. I'm, I'm going to explain this uh, in, in a second. So how we proceed, and they have a, a different approach. Um, right, so maybe the question of the execution of omega, I'm going to skip it. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the, on the question of uh, Feynman diagrams and how they play a role here. So, as, as we saw in the heuristic derivation, we're trying to solve the nonlinear Schrodinger iteratively in order to expand uh, the solution in the data. So, of course, the first iterate is u naught, and it's just the linear solution. The nth iterate, uh, this is what you expect. Uh, you solve for the linear Schrodinger operator, linear Schrodinger equation, with the nonlinearity being uh, one rank before. So I D T U N minus Laplacian U N equals U N minus one squared times U N minus one. And if you sum all these iterates, uh, well, if everything works according to plan, you should get a solution of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, right. So, uh, I know, sorry, I, I, I made a small mistake. Uh, UN at the initial time should be unit, of course. Uh, so now let's try to write U1 in terms of the data U0. Uh, well, this is not very hard. You, you use the Johamel formula and you get the representation that I wrote either in physical space or in Fourier space. Okay. Uh, but now, as, as, as I said earlier, if you want to control the solution, you need to expand at a very high order. And then it becomes very hard to represent uh, the solution UN. If you just use the Hamel's formula, it, it gets out of control pretty fast. Already U2 is, is uh, you know, very uh, complicated. So uh, the solution is to use uh, Feynman diagrams. So we were inspired in doing that by the paper of Lukainen and Spohn, uh, which is uh, very nice. And so uh, we, we, we followed their uh, notations and uh, several ideas that they had. So, Maybe if you're not familiar with these things, let me explain to you how to read a, a such a diagram. So let's look at the representation of U1. Uh, so you see there are three initial vertices which are at the at the bottom of the of the graph, K01, K02, K03, and they should be thought of as uh, in the Duhamel formula. There are three waves which are interacting and giving another wave. So these three waves are each represented by one of these initial vertices. Then these three waves get together and the solution emerges. Okay. So of course for U1, it's, it's not uh, so useful to use this representation because everything is, is simpler. Oh yeah, and we also have signs that indicate whether U carries a bar or, or not. And I should also add that 
as the three waves merge to give a fourth wave, uh, frequencies have to add up to zero, uh, which amounts to uh, a Kirchhoff rule in the graph, namely, right, in the graph, each edge carries a certain frequency. So at the vertex, the three edges meet and give a fourth edge. Now the frequency of the fourth edge is the sum of the frequencies of the three edges. And so this is a Kirchhoff rule. So that was U1. Now let's see U2. Well, U2, you know, so uh, uh, of course it's not all of U2. This is one term in U2 that carries two interactions. Uh, and as you can imagine, if you iterate the Duhamel formula, it means there are more and more uh, there are more and more initial frequencies. There are there are more and more initial vertices, and there are more and more interactions uh, that happen as these uh, initial frequencies gradually merge until uh, the output is is the the solution. Okay, so I, I, I hope it's at least intuitively clear, uh, but mostly these graphs are very useful because they are a way of uh, keeping track of the, the combinatorics of the interaction. And, and uh, well, we'll see how this works. Because now we have this representation, now we would like to compute the expectation of the norm of the modulus squared. So what this means is we take two such graphs, one with a bar, one that doesn't carry a bar, and we take the expectation. Uh, so that's what I call pairing Feynman diagrams. So let's do it for U1. So for U1, uh, there is just two diagrams. So one on the left, one on the right. The one on the left, you should think of it as U1. The one on the right as U1 bar. Sorry, the other around it doesn't matter. One carries a bar, U1 bar, and the other one does not. And then you take the expectation. And we saw taking the expectation through Wick's formula amounts to pairing uh, the initial frequencies. So that's why not only do you have these two uh, diagrams, which are side by side, uh, but also the initial frequencies have to be uh, pairwise equal by, by Wick's formula. Otherwise, the contribution is zero. So, so that's really the object of interest. It's when you take a f two Feynman diagrams, one with bar, one without, you take the expectation, and there is this pairing that appears. Now, of course, we want to do that for uh, un. So suppose now there are n interactions. So there are two uh, trees, which might be very high. One carries a bar, one does not. And you take the expectation, which forces uh, the initial frequencies to be paired. So it, it forces initial frequencies to be pairwise equal. Uh, OK, so that's, of course, a complicated object. Uh, but at least through this representation, we have a chance of understanding it. Uh, while if, if you were doing that at the level of Duhamel formulas, there would be absolutely zero chance. Um, OK, I, I hope I'm being uh, clear. Now, the question is, uh, how can one estimate a Feynman diagram? because that, that's what we want. We want to expand the solution in the data. So we, you, you get this, uh, this series of, of diagrams. Uh, and then you need to show that you know, uh, the series converges, or at least you can control un in L2 squared. So you should think of this diagram. Let's look at this one, for instance. Uh, you should think of it as 
has a very high dimensional um, oscillatory interval. Why high dimensional? Because each vertex carries a factor e to the i t omega, right? At each interaction, uh, you have this factor e to the i t omega. You have many such interactions, uh, and you have uh, initial frequencies that live in a space of very big dimension. So the the question is, how can one estimate this uh, this object, which is which has these oscillations, uh, that that we need to understand? What complicates matters is uh, how how you compute frequencies in such an object. So there is the first rule, which is a Kirchhoff rule or Kirchhoff's law. So at each vertex, frequencies uh, add up. But there is this other uh, requirement that initial frequencies have to be equal pairwise. Uh, so it's it's not trivial how if if I look at a given edge, how the frequency of this edge depends on the initial frequencies, and and the whole difficulty is to reconcile the oscillatory structure of, of these objects given by the e to the i t omega that appear at each vertex to reconcile this with the rule that allows you to uh, to determine what the frequency of each edge is. Uh, so the question in the end is, is to know whether there is enough oscillation. For instance, if all the omegas were zero, if uh, there was absolutely no oscillation in this whole interaction, uh, then we would not be in a very good shape. So you need to exclude something like that, but more generally to quantify uh, how much oscillation is, is present. So if you do that, uh, so this, this happens through a little bit of graph theory. Uh, you, you can show that there is enough oscillation if you look at, at the graph of depth n, and then you're able to uh, essentially sum the, the series. Uh, so that's maybe the first big idea in uh, in our paper, uh, and this leads to an approximate solution, uh, which is the sum of the un. Uh, okay, so it's not so consistent because I, I I defined un as a, well, given the way that I defined un, u app should more be u capital n sorry for the uh, for the typo uh, now if you use Feynman diagrams like i sketched you are able to estimate this u app in xsb so this bogan spaces uh, in average that is after taking the expectation so this part of the proof allows you to construct an approximate solution, which is the expansion to a very high order of the solution in the data. Now, since we're dealing with a nonlinear problem, you need to do something more. You need to show that this approximate solution is stable. It's linearly stable. Uh, so that's the my last slide is about the linear stability of the approximate solution. So suppose you linearize around this approximate solution, so you get this equation, i d t u minus Laplacian u equals script l u, where script l is the linearization of the nonlinear term around this approximate solution. Now the problem is that script l is a very complicated operator, uh, in a way, it's like a potential in a linear Schrodinger equation. 
but it's a time dependent potential. And there are very few tools available to understand uh, linear Schrodinger equations with a time dependent potential. And what's more, uh, this, this uh, potential should be understood e in a random sense. So it's, it's, uh, it's more of an ensemble of potentials. Uh, and, and what we'd like to do is, is to figure out uh, whether most of the time, say, these random potentials um, have, uh, if, you want, if you look at, at this linear problem, whether it has growing modes, typically, or not. Uh, you can think of script L as being just a time independent potential, in which case that's really what we're looking for. You know, is there an, an eigenvalue, uh, a growing mode? Um, but, but it's even worse than that because it's, it's, it's a time dependent potential, so complicated things could happen. So essentially, the trick is to, to use the theory of uh, XSB spaces to reduce the problem to estimating the norm of L, this linearized operator, from XSB to X S minus 1B. So that's a, a simple application of ideas of this uh, Bourguin XSB spaces. And now, uh, Let's think of L as, as a random operators. Let's think of L as a random matrix, right? It's a random matrix, except it's in very big dimension. Um, and this random matrix, how are we going to uh, bound its, its spectrum? Well, what you do in random matrix theory, maybe the most crude way of uh, bounding the spectrum of a random matrix, is, is to uh, compute this, this quantity, expectation of the trace of L star L to the M. So, you know, if, if, if L is a diagonal matrix, say, uh, it's, it's clear that as M gets very big, this will give you a good estimate of, of the largest eigenvalue. And taking the expectation, of this very large power of L star L will allow you to capture uh, cancellations in a very similar way to what we did uh, for the uh, Feynman graphs a little bit earlier. So you, you, actually you can use Feynman graphs here too in order to estimate this, this quantity. And the estimation of this quantity uh, leads you to linearized stability for, for the problem. And from there, uh, the proof is, is almost complete. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, I hope it was relatively clear. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'd be happy to answer any question.